Robert Mariano has been a career police officer who has served in various formations across the country in several capacities. He now sits in the seat as mayor of Dangriga. When our police watch team stopped by to speak to Mariano, he reflected on his years in the police department and how he went from being a police officer to now working for the residents of Dangriga. We will have that discussion after we hear from our partners who make this show possible. The Barry. Shell Belize Limited, BNE Charitable Trust, and the National Gas Company. Shell V Power with three times more cleaning and friction reducing molecules. Go well, go Shell. The facilities at NGC have been engineered to the highest standards. No other LPG facility in this country has the technology, health and safety considerations, and accurate industry-accepted measurement technology as does NGC. Under the watchful eye of the control room, Bowsers are loaded with LPG to deliver to the two depots inland and to the many bulk storage facilities owned by customers all over the country where the wholesale price is one single levelized national price. Now that NGC has entered the market, competition exists for the provision of LPG, both at the wholesale level for acquisition and importation through a transparent tendering system and downstream by more than 30 retailers throughout the country. The National Gas Company of Belize, fueling Belize forward. We are the Barry, offering you great products, good service, and of course, the lowest prices in the entire country. Visit us in Belize City, Belmapan, San Ignacio Cayo, Orndrat, and now in San Pedro, La Isla Bonita. The Barry, get more, be less. Since 2008, the Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust has created opportunities for Belizeans to develop themselves and their communities. The Trust employs tools that are intuitive, collaborative, and accessible so that every Belizean is empowered to achieve their full potential. Over 200,000 Belizeans have been impacted because of our various initiatives. The Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust empowering Belizeans of today to create the Belize of tomorrow. I am at the Dangriga Tong Hall and I always enjoy coming to Dangriga. Dangriga has that special feeling when you drive into Dangriga and you know, especially when you meet old friends like um, the former deputy commissioner of police. If I got it correct, right? I don't want to bring it down, you know, but um, below where you are, you were. Deputy commissioner of police, um, Robert Mariano, who is also now the mayor of Dangriga, a person I've known for quite some time. And let me start off first of all by um, congratulating you on, on, on being the mayor of Dangriga. But we want to get to know you better. You know, you, 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 you joined the police force, you rose all the way up to deputy commissioner, and so on. Let's get to know who is Robert Mariano. Let's start from the very beginning, my brother. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, yes, my name is Robert Mariano. The second, of course, because there's a third Robert Mariano. Um, my father was the first, and so I'm junior. 
and my father had two juniors because his father had two sons by the name of John. And so he picked up his father's um, tradition by naming um, two of his sons with the same name. Um, I come from humble, a humble family. Um, I was raised up by a single mother. My mother name was, or my mother name is Gloria Brown. Um, she was Fernandez before she got married to Brown. And um, she, she had it very hard with us bringing us up as boys, as a matter of fact, at first I didn't went to high school because um, my mother wasn't able to afford to send me and my brother who was about two years older than me who was already going to high school. So um, what she did, she sent me to learn how to sew. And so um, from standard four, she sent me to learn how to sew. By the time I graduated from primary school, I was able to sew already and I was able wow. to sew my own um, graduation clothes. Wow. And after I... Um, that's here in Dangriga, right? Yes, that's right here in Dangriga. Um, I went to the Dangriga Methodist School. And so after I graduated from primary school, I opened my tailor shop and I helped my mother um, in raising up my little brothers and sister. Um, because um, again, like I mentioned, things was very, very hard with her. And at the age of 16, I um, went and joined the Belize Police Force then. It was Belize Police Force. Um, I, from a young boy, wanted to be a member of the police force because my father was a police officer, and I had several family members who were police officers as well. But at that time, um, they allowed us to join police um, force so long as you had a primary certificate. If you remember, in those days, that was like a prep, right? And so it is not the primary school leaving certificate, but it was a special exam that was given to you, um, which was at least one step past um, primary standard, standard six. And so I went and I passed the exam, and so I was allowed to enter into the Belize Police Department. I was 16 years old at that time. I entered the police training school on the 2nd of February, 1982. Were you the youngest um, person to enter the police um, force at that time, at 16? Because 16 is a very young age so to, to really be allowed in the police force. Yes, I was the youngest. And even now, I don't think if anybody break my record in service in the, boli in the Belize police. Usually we're 18. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we graduated on the 21st of May, um, 1982. So we only took just a little over three months in training school at that time. And um, after we completed training, um, I was transferred to Punta Gorda Tong Police Station. However, I would like to mention that we didn't pass out, you know. We were only sent to our formation um, because from 30 of us that entered training school, only 12 of us completed the training. And so we were asked to go to our different formations and then I went to PG, I remained at PG police station, and about six months later on as a young boy, just 17, I was sent to San Pedro Colombia police station, yeah. where I remained there as a police constable for about um, 15 months, just over one year. And then I went back to Punta Gorda Tong police station. I worked there, then I was sent to Cadenas, and you know a lot of people don't talk about Cadenas because Cadenas is almost to the end of uh, Sarstoon River. Yes, it is. Um, in those days when uh, the police is posted in Cadenas, I could tell you that the British were on a hill right above the police station, and it takes something like 20 minutes to walk up or down the hill, and it was just two of us as police officers who remained in, in, in the police station or downstairs. And um, I was really scared because the uh, Guatemala army used to come over to Belize side because there was one family who were living next to the police station and they used to wash for the Guatemalan soldiers and they cooked for them. And at that time I was really, really scared. However, I worked the first month and then I went back to PG and when I... Were there any incidents that happened that maybe would have justified that scared feeling you had? Yes, because um, just before I took over um, the Cadenas police station along with one other person, I could tell about one week before that the Guatemalan army went and they 
attempted to burn down the police station. The, the, the back portion of the building was burnt. And so um, that what made me scared at that time. And um, we weren't equipped because all the police had there was one 38 revolver and a shotgun. And the 38 revolver, there was only six rungs and two rungs for the um, shotgun at that time. So you could imagine what we um, were going through yes. at that time. And I mean, for 20 minutes for the British to reach where we were was a lot of time. You know, you only need one second if you want to do something. To If any one of those um, Guatemalan soldiers wanted to do something to any of us. Um, however, I managed to finish the one month in Cadenas, and I went back to PG, and um, I had two, two postings in Cadenas, because I was the person that had in over Cadenas um, about a year after to the Belize Defense Force. Um, after I handed over, I said, thank God, and knowing that I don't have to go back to Cadenas again, thereafter I was transferred to Pueblo Viejo police station. Mm -hmm. And at Pueblo Viejo, I had a young family. I was very young. And um, I could tell you that um, I lost my first son in Pueblo Viejo um, due to the fact that there wasn't transport to, 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 to transport us to the, to the medical. My whole family got uh, food poison at that time. And um, I later um, got a transport. We went to PG and we went to the medic. The medic said we were OK. They gave us medication. And during the course of the night when we woke up, we found this, my child, who was about three years old, between me and my wife, um, already dead. And that, 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 that's, that's, a scar, that's a scar that will always remain on your memory, I'm up, sure. Up to today. Yeah. Um, but um, when I look back, it was all about service to country and service to people. Um, after the incident happened with my child, I wasn't happy, my, happy again at um, Pueblo Viejo Police Station, so I asked for a transfer. And so I was transferred back to Punta Gorda Tongue Police Station. I um, remained in PG for another year or so. I, 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 altogether, I spent about four years in Punta Gorda Tongue. And as a young constable, I got transferred to Orange Walk Police Station. That was around 1987, to be exact. You, you want to hold the mic? No, no. When, 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 you, when you got transferred um, to Orange Walk, um, did your family move with you, or, 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 or did they remain behind? Yes, my family moved along with me. Again, remember, it was just recent after I lost my first son, and the, the child was my old, eldest son. And so, um, how many children you had then when you lost your, your eldest son? It was two. My my he was the eldest, and I had one other at that time who was along with us. My youngest child then was about six months old, um, and both of them was in the bed along with us. Um, when, the, when we found the, the, the eldest child dead in the bed. And so um, I remained in the Orange Walk for about four months, and I was asked to take over Blue Creek Police Station. Again, that was a border. A border. Well, a border across the area. <laughs> and in that time, it was very, very far. Mm -hmm. The road was not in good shape. And, um, but however, I still went, and I remained in Blue Creek for about three years. It was rough, very rough, but um, one thing I can say that the people in Blue Creek um, were very nice, and they treated me and my family with a lot of respect. And um, so that what encouraged me, and I remained there, and after three years, I was transferred back to Orange Walk Police Station. Again, I remained there for about three months, and I was transferred to Guinea Grass Police Station this time. I remained in Guinea Grass for again another 15 um, months, and I went on three months leave. And uh, after I came off three months leave, I was transferred then to Dangrigatong Police Station. Again, at that time, I would like to say that I had about 10 years of service and was still a constable. Um, but you were still in your 20s because if you started when you were 16 with 10 years of service, now you're back in Dangriga, that means you're about 26, 27. Yes, uh, and at that time, I started seeing um, some of these constables that had worked under my command, because at that time I was a senior police, so the junior police would work under you. And I see some of these junior cop who work under me are now NCOs, they are now corporal. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, it, it, it get me frustrated. And I went and I had a discussion with one of my brother, Charles, who um, was a corporal of police, and I, you know, I discussed it with him. 
and he started discussing it with me and we realized that in 1982 when I was at training school, we were only doing subjectives and we realized that the department have changed from not just subjective, but it also includes objectives. So I, I had problem in dealing with the objectives. And so um, he was the one that teached me the art of understanding the objectives. And so um, he started showing me the farmer how to do the, the new type of studies. And so... Um, no, 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 no. For, 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 for those who, who, who might not realize the difference between subjective and the objective where the policing is concerned, could you elaborate on that a little bit for me? when you say subjective versus objective? Yeah, well, this, the subjective uh, is a written exam uh, where they ask you a question and you need to write the answer. And uh, in those days, the exam was real tough. Uh, uh, they would ask you how to define a, an offense. And uh, you cannot miss nothing. It, you, you really have to know it and understand it. And you need to know how to, they would give you a scenario and you need to identify what offense was committed, and you need to see how you deal with it, or how um, you know that that is the offense that is committed. However, the objective was kind of confusing because the answers are similar to multiple choice, and then the answers, they, they would have answers there that are similar, which confuse you. You know, and so one of the things my brother told me, when you, what you do is read the question, answer it, and don't let anything disrupt you, disrupt you. If you say this is the answer, you go direct to that, find that, and then you answer that. And so um, the first exam I took after that, I was successful. Okay. And I passed my first exam to Carpal. Uh -huh. Right, and so I got promoted. I think I was um, about 27 years old at that time, more or less. Okay. Yeah, 27, 28. And then um, I got promoted, and when I got promoted, um, he called me again and he told me, well, no, you have to think how you'll strategize to become a sergeant. So I tell him, like, what is your idea? He said, well, you know what? What is a sergeant position? One of the strongest things is prosecution. So I say, okay. So I asked to be a prosecutor. They didn't, my officer commanding then didn't give me the position of being a prosecutor. But um, what I like at that time, the then sergeant, Every day, he knew, since he knew I wanted to be a prosecutor, I don't know where he disappeared to, but he would call me and say, Mark, go to court and do me. Adjournment, say, no, before you're done, I, I, I will be there to, to do the new cases. And I went, and he didn't come back. And every day, I do different things. I learn how to present a case at court. Then I learn how to read facts. Then I start practicing. I did disorderly conduct, small offenses, indecent words. Then I went and started to do small cases like, Tef and so on, and I did know my officer was watching me at court, uh -huh. and later on he called me and he said, you are doing a good job at court, you are now the prosecutor. Yes. And so I remained there, and exactly after two years and a half, I was a sergeant of police. Yeah. And you stayed like at that. court for a while, right? For not yes. I can recall you at the court for a long I time. I remained at court for a long while. I remember working first with, um, I can't remember some of the judges, their names. Um, but uh, or the magistrate, sorry. I remained there with several different magistrates, and then um, about three years after I was at court, when I received a call, they OC one to see me. And when I went to see him, he's saying that they are looking for the best prosecutor of the country. They want the person to go and become the prosecutor at court number one in Belize City. And he's saying, well, I know you, I believe you are the best. I said, well, I'm not sure because I don't have much experience. I'm only, I only prosecute here in Dangriga, right? He said, Mara, I have confidence in you. I need to have confidence in yourself. And so they sent me to Bamapan. I talked with Mr. Bernard, the late Bernard, and Mr. Bernard um, told me, Mara, I need for you to go next week, as early as next week, to take over court number one. And when I went to court number one, I met Adolf Lucas. He was the chief magistrate then and the magistrate for um, court number one. And he said, prosecutor, I hope you come ready, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I start getting scared. Uh, and however, I, one thing with me, I, I, I love challenge in life. Yeah. You know, and um, I went and I start prosecuting, and the first day, I won three cases in front of Mr. Lucas. But as I go to court daily, I realize that the case only start getting harder and harder. I realize that the cases, one case, you have two, three attorneys. 
um, and I am there alone to fight these three attorneys. And uh, you know, I learned a lot, I think, as a prosecutor, because police um, officers, they have, what the prosecutor especially, have at least 10 case files in front of them every day. And the attorneys would go and do one case. And these prosecutors need to know these full 10 cases. They need to know their witnesses. They need to know what is their, um, their evidence and so on in the case. So um, I took up the challenge and I, I got a lot of um, reprimand from Mr. Lucas, um, but it made me strong and stronger and stronger and stronger. I could never forget one year after I was in front of Mr. Lucas, he said, prosecutor, you are not to go anywhere. I need to take you in front of your commander at midday. I got scared because I was wondering why he will take me in why front of my command. And how, because he's a disciplinarian and one he, he work on time. Yeah. Strike 12, he was there. Yeah. Let's go. Took me in his vehicle. Instead, I saw him going to the command on Raccoon Street. We went to a nice restaurant in Belize City. Okay. And um, we sit down and he said, you can order anything you want to eat or drink today. You are now qualified to be a prosecutor. That's what he told me. And I got such a relief, you know. And must have been relief indeed. Yes, and he started to advise, in, continue to advise me, say, you are doing this, you are doing that good, but you still need to look in certain areas, and you still need to do this, and you still need to do that. You know, he continued to groom me, which I appreciate. And so um, after I finished from Mr. Lucas' court, after he left, he went to be um, the DPP. Yeah. I could tell you that I was able to work in almost any area in the police department. Any, any, any area, CIB, um, prosecution branch, any area you think about. As a matter of fact, I even had the opportunity. I got training with the FBI. I got um, one, one month training with the FBI. At that time, it was ISITAP. I got training with the DEA. Mm -hmm. I got training with Homeland Security. I got training with a lot of different um, organizations from all over the world. Um, still at the courts. Why still at the courts? Yes, I got transferred though from court number one, and I got transferred to Corozal Tong Police Station. And um, when I reached, I see a lot of faults in the prosecution section, and I went to fix it. And so Mr. Jeffries then asked me to remain as the prosecutor in court in, in the court in Corozal. Mm -hmm. And um, about six months later, when an exam came up, and uh, I was qualified to be to take the exam to be an assistant inspector then. And I went and I took the exam. Uh, I also groomed the, the, the staff in, in, in Corozal. And I could tell you from 15 persons who I groomed or trained in Corozal to be to, to, for the exam, 12 of them passed, including myself. Wow. Right? I, got, I, I passed the exam to assistant inspector. Um, but I wasn't promoted until one year after I passed the exam. Mm -hmm. And then um, I remained in Corozal and was transferred in CIB in Belize City. But when I was sent in CIB, I was sent there as file reader. And so I was assisting in, in rehabilitating case file and um, teaching the officers how to do their files and so on, so that they know how to present their files to, to, the, to the court. And um, I remained there for about a an year, and then I got promoted to deputy OC um, CIB in Belize City. I was there for about um, six months, and then I became the officer commanding. Um, CIB, Eastern Police Division. Again, I remained there for about one year, and I got transferred to, um, it was then, um, how you call it? I forgot the name. Uh, but PSB, it's no PSB, but it is Internal Affairs. Mm -hmm. Yes, that time we call it Internal Affairs. Yeah, okay, uh, you were transferred to the Professional Standards Bureau, PSB. Yes, but at that time, it, they, they used to call it Internal Affairs at that time. And so I was the Commander Internal Affairs for about how long? Three years and a half. And um, I formed a relationship with um, the Ombudsman office then. Um, that time, Mr. Paul Rodriguez oh, was in yeah. charge of, um, and we had Mr. Gazman Ellis who was in charge of the Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. And so what I did uh, was to form a tripartite council for human rights with the police department, Ombudsman, and the, C and, and the human rights. So um, we went all around the country to make presentation to the police department, the entire police department, where we, 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 we talked to them about um, human rights and the rights of the citizens and so on. 
And um, after three years and a half, I was sent to be, for the first time, officer commanding Orange Rock Town Police Station. That was my first formation that I took over. And remind me, your rank at that time was? I went to Orange Rock as a superintendent of police, uh -huh. yes. Um, after I, and, and thanks for bringing it up, because after I got assistant inspector, I got inspector in CIB, because we were asked to take another exam. I passed the exam again and I became inspector. But when I went to PSB, or internal affairs, I was promoted to assistant uh, superintendent. superintendent, and about two years later, I became superintendent. Yeah. So when I went to Orange Rock, I was uh, superintendent. I spent three years in Orange Rock, and just before I left, I got senior superintendent. But um, from all of that time, the, the most horrible time I spent in the police department was in Orange Rock when I was... Why is that? Well, I was... After the change of government um, in, I think it was 2008? Was yeah, it? It, it was 2008 when, when, yeah, when, when the UDP became the government, yes. uh, taking over the PUP. Yeah. I was called and asked to um, go, to the, I was called about midnight and told to just go to the police station and to remove my stuff that I'm being transferred. So I asked them, I tell them, well, you know what? Oh, no, you can't transfer me. So I was a senior officer. And I am under the public service regulation, so... But who, uh, would have been, who would have given you such a call? Well, it came from the commissioner then, okay. right? And um, he told me, Marno, I agree, just go. I know that he was acting under instructions instruction. at that time. And so I get up the morning and I um, went and packed up what I had in the office and I left. Uh, I went on one month vacation leave before they called me and told me to go and be um, deputy officer commanding Eastern Police Division. And I went and I took it over as well. And I, I still went with a good spirit. And um, since I, I was there with a good spirit, it, it, it appears that it wasn't enough for the then politicians. Mm -hmm. And um, they transferred me to Punta Gorda as a senior superintendent. And you can check the records for yourself. No senior superintendent have ever worked in Punta Gorda, never. That's a position for assistant superintendent or a superintendent. But the objective was to discourage me and to um, get me, let me um, resign or to walk off. Frustrate, what, frustrate, frustrate me, yes. But I didn't get frustrated. The people of PG will tell you. And even now, the people of PG still call for Mariano to go back, even after I re retire, to go back to PG as the boss of police. Because I know um, service to country and service to people. And again, it is something that I love doing. And I don't like to see things crumbling, crumbling around me. And so I did what needs to be done. And I left from PG with high respect, high regards, and with merits. Now, could I ask a question here? Um, why would the politicians have picked on you? Were you in any way showing any bias towards a political party? Why, why, why do you think they picked on you like that, in, in that manner? Well. All I can say, Chief, is that the fact that when you're a commanding officer, you'd have to make decision at time. And the minute you don't make decision in favor of anybody, they start feeling like you're taking sides. But there are times you will have to make decision even against the ruling party. And there were times I did because I could remember arresting a politician who uh, went and disrupt a political meeting. And this political meeting had permit uh, they had permit to do their political meeting, but the other one didn't. And so we went and, along with the team, and we arrested the, the politician. And thereafter, they campaigned that as soon as they win, they would have got rid of me. But um, I was like a rock, and so they had problem in getting rid of me. So I, they shifted you all around. All around. They did me this, they did me that, they did me all sort of things. And I went to PG, like I say, I worked there in PG almost five years as... Commander, I still didn't get discouraged, Chief. I had even more courage, mm -hmm. and I had even more ganas. I did pol um, I do a lot of meeting with people. I go and I do community service uh, for the people. There, there's so much thing I did in PG. I didn't give up regardless of what the politicians did. They tried to do with me. And afterwards, they farm. They, it was then they start farming um, the regional commanders. And so I got transferred to Dangriga, since they couldn't break me. 
And then um, since Dangriga is the head for the South, they were forced to put me to be the first regional commander for the South. They had a problem with it at first, right? But afterwards, when they realized, they said, you can't put nobody head over Mariano. And they knew that I could have took the matter to court. And so they had me um, as the regional commander for the South. And it was then the, um, the politician mentioned, well, there will be no promotion unless for those who pass. Because if crime is up in your formation, then you are not passing. And so they say, at the end of the day, we will review what the crime was last year and um, next year. And whosoever reduced crime by 20% will get promotion. And at that time, the record will show you that the South reduced crime by at least 30%. So they didn't have, they didn't have any discretion then. They had was to promote me, and I got promoted to um, assistant commissioner of police. Right? I spent um, about eight years as assistant, as, as senior superintendent, eight or nine years, more or less. Assistant commissioner, I mean? No, no senior superintendent. Senior super okay, and who, how much as assistant um, commissioner? No, um, I think it was three years as assistant commissioner, and then afterwards I become the deputy commissioner of police. But again, I continue to excel. Um, I am a person that reach out to the community and the people. I'm not that kind of leader that um, just stay um, shut in or lacking. I'm always out uh, working as well, along with my subordinate. It is my style to lead from the front, not from behind. I like to, when there's 10th of September, um, Independence Day, um, 20, 21st of September, I am one of those leaders that come out or goes out with their subordinates. I walk the ground with them. Right? I see what they're seeing, I do what they do, and if I see there's any problem, I'm there to help them make decisions. I don't leave them there alone. Right? And so um, I personally, th that is just my style. Like I mentioned earlier, um, I remember when I was a young policeman, I went to a church and I could never forget when the pastor said, um, the people who is more greater and more important amongst you should be a servant. And even now, I use that as my guide to, 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 to serve my people. I am not those kind of person that um, feel as master when I get into authority or into office. I see myself as servant. So my style of leading is the style of the servant. Okay. So now, now, now you're at um, Deputy Commissioner of Police. How long did you say that? That's, a, that's the second highest position in the police department, if I'm correct. Uh, how long did you stay there? One year. And after that, I retired. But I retired I, because you reached retirement age, or because you wanted to retire? I reached the age of 55, 55 years old, and you know that is the retirement yeah, age in Belize. Yeah. And so I retired 55. Um, at that time, I asked, him, well, if they would like to give me a contract to assist in dealing with case files in the police department or in areas of management. Um, that I was doing in the police department for at least my last five years. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, uh, the commissioner then said yes. But when I wrote the letter to the ministry, there was no response. So I just went home and, um, you know, they said, brain is a devil workshop. I didn't even have in mind that I want to get involved in politics. That's what I wanted to ask you. Um, you, you retire from the police department in this very high position. You, um, you asked for a contract. You did not get the contract, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what were you doing to sustain yourself in between, say, af after leaving the, the department? Well, um, really, I knew that I would have retired. And so five years before I retired, I saved. Since I, my kids were all adult, all adult, and so I saved 50% of my salary. Right, and so um, I, I started to prepare for, 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 for retirement. And um, I knew that I was going to get a handsome pension and get ready. Of course, for so many years. For so many years, yes. And so um, I also have um, properties that I own. Oh. I have two in PG. I have one in Orinjuak, and oh. I have two here in Dangriga, that, and one in Belmopan that I knew I was I was renting as well, so that helped bring in some allowance. That, that, give, that give you the income to, to carry yourself over. Yeah. When we come back, Mariano shares how he was persuaded to throw his hat into the political arena. 
Shell V-Power with three times more cleaning and friction reducing molecules. Go well, go Shell! The facilities at NGC have been engineered to the highest standards. No other LPG facility in this country has the technology, health and safety considerations, and accurate industry-accepted measurement technology, as does NGC. Under the watchful eye of the control room, Bowsers are loaded with LPG to deliver to the two depots inland and to the many bulk storage facilities owned by customers all over the country, where the wholesale price is one single levelized national price. Now that NGC has entered the market, competition exists for the provision of LPG both at the wholesale level for acquisition and importation through a transparent tendering system and downstream by more than 30 retailers throughout the country. The National Gas Company of Belize, fueling Belize forward. We are the Barry, offering you great products, good service, and of course, the lowest prices in the entire country. Visit us in Belize City, Belmapan, San Ignacio Cayo, Orndrag, and now in San Pedro, La Isla Bonita. The Barry, get more, Pieles. Since 2008, the Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust has created opportunities for Belizeans to develop themselves and their communities. The Trust employs tools that are intuitive, collaborative, and accessible so that every Belizean is empowered to achieve their full potential. Over 200,000 Belizeans have been impacted because of our various initiatives. The Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust empowering Belizeans of today to create the Belize of tomorrow. Now, um, the political side of it, um, what prompted that, 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 that leap into politics, um, direct leap? When I tell you, Nola, I never even think about politics. Um, I have a cousin and friend, her name is Marta, Lina, no, Marta Robinson. Um, she, I don't know who was telling her things, but every day she come and she tell me, um, if I don't know to run as mayor, I say no. What year are we talking about, um, more or less, at that this time? It was um, 20, last year was 20, 20 2021. 2020, 2020, yes, 2020. Okay, so you left the police department um, in 2020. 2020? Yes, May 2020, I retired, third of May 2020. So I remained home, had nothing to do, it was very, very boring. You know, um, as a. And country, then COVID came. COVID came, and, you know, it, it, I was a bit frustrated, and so I remember that I have my trade, that, and, and I had a so in school in Belize City. I couldn't have attended the, to, to, to teach a, a lot because um, it was costly to have to go to Belize City to teach. But I had started the program like two years before and I um, had taught some people already and I also gave them the course of training trainers. So I had all confidence that they were able to do it. So I was only able to go to Belize City occasionally. So what I did, I started a school in Dangriga and I also started a school in Punta Gorda Tongue as well. So that's what um, keep me going and, and busy. Um, then, I, you know, I love fishing, so I would go and fish at, at times. I spent a lot of time in the waters fishing. And then um, she continued talking to me. I didn't really take it, I didn't. And then uh, family members, she started reaching out to family members and friends and- uh, Talk to everybody to try to convince you, you and everybody that she could get hold of. Yes, and I tried my best. I, I disregarded her. And then um, we have the guy, Derek Velasquez, who wanted to put up a slate, and then he come and he asked me to be a part of his slate as well. And that was independent, right? Uh, no, he was also a part of POP. POP okay. 
Yes, I told him if I run, I would have to run as mayor. I don't want to run as a councillor. Tell him, I tell him I'm well qualified. So I didn't, I still didn't agree. But the, the pressure from members of the public um, caused me to give in. And so I offered myself as a candidate. And um, in February 2021, we had a convention. I contested against Derek Velasquez, and I defeated him in the convention. And so I became the mayoral candidate for the People's United Party. Um, and then we went into the election, and I also won the election. Um, thanks to the police department, I have a wealth of experience in management and administration. And I think that for, to, to do this kind of work, it's important to have that kind of experience because managing the finance of the people is important, right? As a matter of fact, I just last week um, released uh, to the public some of the things that we have achieved over the past year. Could we look at some of that release that you released? What were some of the accomplishments? Um, okay, if you look at this building, we paint this entire building. This building, I'd want you to see what it looked like before we were here. So we, we paint this entire building with the assistance of the Taiwanese um, embassy. We, we had an erosion at the Anglican school. Um, the school was at least one foot inside the sea. And if you go there now, we have uh, reclaimed at least 25 foot of beach in front of the school. I remember seeing footage on, on, on that project. I thought it was a very good project when I, when, when I saw it. So we also did manual paving on Kashan Yunus Street. None of these streets were paved that I'm talking about, of course. We paint um, Bengoche Park. When you say manual paving, what do you mean by manual paving? Well, because you see, Chief, when people um, pave, the equipment do everything. Yes. But when you go and see the manual paving today, I'm hopeful that you'll have a few minutes. I would like to see that. Everything is done manually by man, by hand. By hand. So the tar itself is actually cooked, like when you cook pan fire hat, uh -huh. in, in large um, drums. And then the, the guys, they put it in a container, another drum, half of a drum, and then they actually have a catch a, a, a catch pan with a stick that they use to catch the tar when it is hot and throw it on the road. And then these guys are there manually with, with, um, with the speed, throwing the, the chip on the road. So, and it is much, much cheaper than if we have to hire the company because I, could, I will show you a street right in front of the bus terminal that we paved, um, but we hired a company to do that and it cost us like $60,000. And it's a short piece of road and I could tell you that we do road three times that, um, which costs us a little bit less than 60000 So it's much cheaper when we do it manually than when we hire these private companies to get it done. So it, it's important to, 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 to do it manually so that we can stretch our dollars to, to, to do more projects. Mm -hmm. And then we, we did a new road in Wagirale area. Um, we do a road and um, we just do a part of um, Commerce Street. Okay. Um, we have Harlem Street as we speak. We're getting ready to do that whilst we are paving um, Lakeland area at this time. So we're doing two streets at the same time. Uh, we also pave Oak and Tebrew Street. Uh, we do part of Aranda Crescent, which is also paved. Um, we also pave in front of the Adventist School. And we also pave uh, Cedar Street. Uh, we also did three new roads in uh, the Rivers Estate area. We did several speed bumps around Dangria Tong. Um, we upgraded the third nude side park. We assisted with Bengoche Park. We assisted with the Bengoche Basketball Court. We also upgraded uh, the Wagirale area football field. Um, we upgraded Drums of Our Fathers. Elio Benny Park, and also Rises Bregal Monument. So, and these are only a few of some of the things that we have done over the past year. And um, we were able to do that through partnering with um, government and non-governmental agency, um, because I realized that um, we won't be able to do it all by ourselves. Uh, and so I reached out to these non-governmental agencies to assist 
Uh, like for example, uh, when we first started, we had the um, Ministry of Infrastructure um, who assisted us with trucks, but now they are under heavy pressure. So for the past uh, four or five months, we we are not able to get assistance from them. So what we are doing now is um, to do it with our own equipment. Thank God we have our own grader and our own our own and our own backhoe. So those are the main equipment that we need to do these streets, but we still have to um, hire a roller. Uh, the roller is pl play a very integral role in doing uh, the, the different streets. Yes, and so um, we have um, a target of seven streets for this year. Last year we were able to do seven, and so we target another seven for, for this year. Uh, we have other projects that we, we have listed at this time to do for the next year from 2022 to 2023. Yeah. Now, what's your relationship like with your, your predecessor, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Humphreys? Do you get along? Yes, I, I think me and Mayor Humphreys have a very good working relationship. As a matter of fact, after I um, got into office, there was an issue that came up with the river where a local wanted to privatize the riverside. And there is a portion of the riverside that was privatized, a small area, by the previous administration. And so um, I had us to consult Mayor hum Farmer Mayor Humphreys, and I discussed the issue with him. And um, I could tell you that he responded back. Uh, we discussed the matter together, and um, I could safely say that um, whenever I need advice on things that occurred before I took over office, he's always willing to get back in touch with me and to um, appraise me as to the situation from where it was um, when they were in office. Let's look at now at your, your personal ventures, particularly your sewing factory. Well, how, how is that doing? Well, I could tell you safely um, in Dangriga, we have at least um, 40 women, single mothers, who have benefited from that program, who I could safely say they can sew and make clothes for themselves and their children and their families all by themselves. They can even some of them are even working from home already. Now, uh, we have two phases. We have the sewing school and we have the sewing factory. Now, the sewing school name is Wanichigo, um, but we use the same place to, to do the sewing factory. But um, the school, at times, we use the, the Methodist school, and then we use the market, a, a small portion of the market we use as the um, factory, and the reason why is because the school, you know, school is open now, and so they, they, we can't have the factory there because we need people to be stationary at a full-time place. Um, also, um, the fa in the, when you visit the factory later on, you will see that they have some things, a few things on display already. Um, most of the things were sold, and we are reopening now because due to the COVID, they had shut down. It was scary for them when one or two of the um, workers that were there um, had caught um, COVID, and some of them were exposed to it, and a few of them had caught it. So they, they weren't working for full time, but now that the country is opening up, we are starting again. We have received um, some concession from uh, the police department, the youth department, and some other government department who have offered us to, um, to store uniform for them. Um, but at this time, the building that they're using is very, very small. And so I'm looking how um, I can get assistance in buying a building for them um, because it's important. It, create, it will create employment for these single mothers. And um, the building will cost close to 20000 I last week went and visited a place that do building, and I noticed it is 20000 and so I am using my influence as mayor to see how I can um, raise that money to assist these women. Um, and as soon as that is done, we will be forming a board of directors to, to ensure that the right thing is done. And then the, the, the swing factory will be handed over to, to the board. Now, what are the requirements of these women to attend the swing factory? Is there uh, the school? Is there a fee that they pay or how, 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 how does that work? No, nobody pay anything at all. It's totally free. Um, free? Free, yes, free. So and any, even any, when, any woman in, in Dangria can go and re register and say, I want to learn to sew, and you, and for no financial compensation, they learn? 
Yes, it's totally free. Even after I retired, Chief, um, I have some friends in the United States who assist in sending cloth. Um, when cloth is done, I, they could tell you I use out of my own money to buy material for them. But um, right now, I could tell you that um, sometimes last year we get assistance from um, Minister Dolores. Um, after she received some donation from the Taiwan Embassy, we have received some cloth, and so we have material at this time. Um, it is not as much as we want because the material is what um, they are using to make products to sell, right? And they are selling their product, but at this time we are using a portion of that to, 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 to use on, in, in the school. But uh, we have a, a lady that lives in the United States who called me sometimes this week and said that she's sending a barrel with cloth for the, the school itself. Because we can't confuse the school from the, from, with, the, with the factory because... Um, if we use the material um, which is for the factory we are there to sew and, and, and make clothes and, and, and to sell, then very soon that will finish and then um, there won't be any material for the um, factory to continue. And the proceeds of the sale of these, of these clothes from the factory um, go to the maintenance of the factory and, and, and do the women get a stipend? Yes, the women the get a stipend from that and then they use a portion of the money to buy back um, material. So, um, so really, it's not a profit making, making venture for you? This time, no, well, for me, there's nothing in it um, for me any at all. Um, because, like I say, I still have to um, take money at times out of my pocket um, to, to, to do this. And the, the, the ladies in PG will tell you, and the ladies in Belize City will tell you, I take money out of my pocket to get this done. As a matter of fact, just last week I went to PG and we donated another sewing machine to PG, but PG doesn't have a sewing factory as such, as yet they only have a school. Um, but uh, this sewing, and strange chief, when I was in the police department, um, when I was a young constable, you know, I was making a very, very, very small salary and my wife had kids um, every year. And so things was real rough and tough. How many children you got, by the way, since you said? <laughs> I have a lot of kids. Um, I would say seven. Okay. Right? And um, the salary, I, you, yeah, know, the salary. you know, Chief, when I was a young constable, I was only making like $165 and, um, f end of the month uh -huh. and about $145, $15. Uh -huh. uh, things was real rough. It, was, it wasn't... Um, I wasn't able to suffice myself. When I don't pay my food, I don't have nothing. And so I used to do sewing, and that's what used to help me. I used to sew for a lot of people. I used to make a lot, a lot of money from sewing. And this is why I always tell people that oh, we, could, um, we have to do something to help boost our economy, mm -hmm. right? Because I could remember some years ago when I was a little boy, China was such a poor country. And after China started exporting clothes and so on, you start to see China economy start boozing. Uh, can we do the same in Nangriga? Of course. You know, and I think that oh, we would be one of the first in this country to have our own local um, sewing factory, right? And so uh, I am pushing on that, and it is something that we must achieve um, for this year. No if, but or maybe. And I'm hopeful that that achievement can be made between now and six months' time. So turning to the other eras of perhaps economic development in Dangriga, uh, beside, or, or beside the sewing that, that you have um, worked so well, done so well with, um, let's look at things like maybe the Commerce Byte Port and its impact. Um, what would you like to see done there and other things that you'd like to see done in your municipality to uplift the municipality economically? Um, one of the things I'm looking at at this time is to see how we can make Dangriga a tourist destination as well. Um, Dangriga has the same thing like all the um, tourist destinations in this country. We have the sea, like everybody else. We have the sun, like everybody else. And we have the sun. I forgot the culture. Exactly. And, and, and uh, the thing is that every tourist destination you go in this country, they are selling Garifuna culture. And now this is a Garifuna community. If they can sell our culture, then we can do the same. And so just yesterday I was having a meeting with um, Chico Ramos, and I was saying to him, we have to see how we can change this, because I noticed Dangrega is only a tourist destination, mostly on the 18th and 19th. We need to change that 
to make sure that we can have people often come into Dangriga. So we have to look at ways of how we can get that done, right? And one of the things we, we want to promote our music and our culture, and so I'll be having a meeting, um, I think in the next week or two, with the people at own hotels and the business community, and those people that are involved in the culture to see how we can partner together, mm -hmm. right? But you also mentioned about the, um, the jetty. Mm -hmm. Jetty is a must. We, we, we must uh, reopen jetty because... That's how much bite, by the way. That's how much bite. Um, do you know that jetty is the only port in this whole country that doesn't need to be dredged? We have deep waters there. The larger ship can come and dock right there without any kind of problem. And so we start to wonder why is it that Dangriga port cannot be utilized? Because we need to create employment for our people as well, right? And so I, I had a meeting just last week with the ERA rep, and according to him, um, there, there is um, information in the making that um, Jet or the commerce bite should be reopened very soon for small cruise ship. Um, and he's hopeful that that could happen before the end of this year. Uh, it is very hopeful. Uh, and so I continue to uh, negotiate, uh, discuss with him because it is something that our people want. They need it. And so we need to work together to ensure that this happens. As a matter of fact, um, one of the persons who want to operate from the commerce, but it's important to, for me to discuss. I want to hear what he's offering. And, and at the same time, we want to encourage our people to, to, to see how we can have our own local tourist village because we have a portion of land right there on the north, part of Dangriga, the Greens, yeah. where our people are um, encouraging them to come and to put small business on the beach so that we can start to do our own local tourist village as well. So you're referring to that same area where the old pier was, the old, the, the old, the old wharf, because I've always admired that area and said that, you know, I wonder why, you know, maybe we could dredge and build up back the beach in, in, in that area. Or as a matter of fact, for your information, last month I had a meeting with the Minister of Tourism, and it was the same thing we were discussing about. And the Minister of Tourism have um, committed to me that he will be partnering with the Dangria Town Council to see how um, we c he can help in developing and fixing up our beach and to see how he can encourage some business people to come and do business in, uh, on, on, on our beach. And at the same time, I'm encouraging our own locals because it is time for our local people to get involved in tourism as well. Yeah. As a matter of fact, what I'm doing or what this council is doing at this time is to and to encourage entrepreneurship is to give local people free trade license. Wow. Just to encourage them because we know that for them to prepare it will be costly. Yes. So we don't want to be taxing them at the same time for their business, right? But after a year, two years, then they will have to start to pay, right? But they won't pay retroactive. For that year or two, it will be totally free mm -hmm. because we just want to encourage entrepreneurship from our end. Yeah. We will wrap up our conversation with Mayor Robert Mariano after a word from our partners. The Barry, Shell Belize Limited, BNE Charitable Trust, and the National Gas Company. Shell V Power with three times more cleaning and friction reducing molecules. Go well, go Shell. The facilities at NGC have been engineered for the highest standards. No other LPG facility in this country has the technology, health and safety considerations, and accurate industry-accepted measurement technology as does NGC. Under the watchful eye of the control room, Bowsers are loaded with LPG to deliver to the two depots inland and to the many bulk storage facilities owned by customers all over the country where the wholesale price is one single levelized national price. Now that NGC has entered the market, competition exists for the provision of LPG, both at the wholesale level for acquisition and importation through a transparent tendering system and downstream by more than 30 retailers throughout the country. The National Gas Company of Belize 
fueling Belize forward. We are the Barry, offering you great products, good service, and of course, the lowest prices in the entire country. Visit us in Belize City, Bermapan, San Ignacio Cayo, Old York, and now in San Pedro, La Isla Bonita. The Barry, get more, feelings. Since 2008, the Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust has created opportunities for Belizeans to develop themselves and their communities. The Trust employs tools that are intuitive, collaborative, and accessible so that every Belizean is empowered to achieve their full potential. Over 200,000 Belizeans have been impacted because of our various initiatives. The Belize Natural Energy Charitable Trust empowering Belizeans of today to create the Belize of tomorrow. Now, Mayor Mariano, you told me earlier that um, it was very unlikely some years ago, a few years ago, just a few years ago, that you would actually be sitting in this chair. But here you are, a first-time mayor, first-term mayor. What has it been like? There was a feeling like being a first-term mayor, and what are some of the challenges you encountered here at City Hall, and what's the way forward for Mayor Robert Mariano? Uh, thank you for that question again, Chief. Uh, being a mayor uh, here in Dangriga, and for the first time, of course, like you rightly mentioned, uh, when it comes to managing the, 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 the affairs, I don't have much problem in that area because, again, I was in charge of administration for the police department, and so most of the work that is done there is similar to what I was doing in the police department, and the um, the amount of responsibility and finances that I was managing in the police department is or was much huger than what I am managing at this time. The only difference is uh, the thing is managing a whole town rather than to just manage a police department. Um, so the administrative part of it is not hard, but the difficult part of it is uh, the resource, uh, the, the, the limited resource um, that the council had and still have at this time because um, when we take over, um, there's so much things that uh, we found that needs to be done in Dangriga. The roads are in and are still in very bad condition and this is why um, at this time I and the council is working in decorating Dangriga so that Dangriga can look and compete like every other tongue in, in this country. Um, so decorating Dangriga is one of our priority at this time. But what is more priority for us is to see how we can create employment for our people because there are a lot of people who are seeking employment and cannot be employed. So um, this is why we are trying to encourage local entrepreneurship so that people can create employment at the same time. And we are looking at other avenues and working with um, government and non-governmental organization to see how they can assist because developing our people is our priority. We need to help develop um, our people and most of these people, they really need help. And as, uh, as the leader of the community, I and the council need to partake and to reach out to the different organizations, government and non-governmental organization, to see how um, we can help our people in this town. There's a mayor's association, and I take it that the association exists so that as mayors you can learn from each other and come up with different ideas and, and, and really en enlist, um, I would say, um, ways forward um, from amongst yourselves. Um, how is your relationship with the mayor's association? I have a very good working relationship with the mayors in the mayor's association. As a matter of fact, on Friday we had a meeting in Orange Walk 
and um, we exchange information in those meetings. As a matter of fact, the manual paving that we are doing at this time, um, we got training from the personnel in Orange Walk. We, I communicated with them, uh, with the mayor of Orange Walk, and he sent um, personnel in two different times here in Dangriga. And at the same time, we have um, people from our town council that works in a different strategic area. And I could tell you that now we are doing our own manual paving. Um, we also have areas of exchange of information. As a matter of fact, um, recently there is a mayor who is asking for certain assistance. And we as a council are coming together to see how we can help him. Uh, we also discuss issues of uh, where uh, the previous councils or the previous mayor association um, had things on the table that I wasn't aware of. Uh, for example, the expansion of um, Dangriga and other municipalities. Uh, we're working on that. And uh, very soon I could say that um, it, it is in a stage of final um, approval. And so um, it is something that we need because there's a, the, the boundary of Dangriga at this time, there's a lot of people who didn't even know that Dangriga is so small. And that's why it's important for us to expand. And so um, we have forwarded the documents. Uh, and so um, we're only waiting for that final approval. Uh, we have several other things, like, for example, the trade license. The trade licensing act um, is, is being approved. At this time, there'll be a new trade licensing um, act. And um, in the mayor's association meeting, we talk a lot about that new act. Um, also, we have people from local government who um, mentioned to us that they'll be going to the different municipalities. To, to meet the different business people to share about the new um, trade licensing act. Um, because people need to know how, it will, how they will be affected by the new act. And there are several other um, initiatives um, that the Mayor's Association is doing, and one of them being um, the, how you call it, um, where you can pay for, to, to, to have your vehicle park. Oh, park, uh, parking meters. Parking meters, yes. Um, so we, they also part, part, um, pass a parking meter act, and Belize City will rule it out very, very soon, and they're encouraging the different municipalities to do the same, and it is something uh, I will be meeting with my people, my technical people here in Dangriga, and ask if it is necessary, um, because um, the only area that is congested in Dangriga would be the main street, the, con the commerce street, and so um, we, we may use one or two um, meter here in Dangriga as well. But there are several things that the, the association um, um, look at, and it's important for the different municipalities to attend because we, we, we learn from each other in, in the different meetings. Mayor, you mentioned um, a while ago the size of Dangriga as a tongue. Um, what, what is the size of Dangriga exactly? Where it starts, where it ends? Right now. You wouldn't even believe Dangriga starts right there in front of the Gulisi Primary School. When you enter Dangriga, I don't know if you know where the Gulisi Primary School is. Yes, where the it museum starts, is. The, 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 yes, it uh, starts right there. But we are recommending that it move all the way to three and a half miles. Okay. So um, we'll be having an extension of two miles in that area. And um, when you go to Commerce Bight, as soon as just after you pass the Holy Ghost School, just about 100 feet or 100 yards past where they go to school at the first bridge right there. Uh -huh. um, there where Dangriga ends as well. And commerce might begin. <laughs> and commerce might begin from there, <laughs> right? However, recommendation oh, is yeah, been made well. that Dangriga will now reach at the commerce by port. Port, uh -huh. right? And, and the port will be a part of Dangriga. It will and, be a part and, of Dangriga and, and, whenever the act is approved, yeah. yes. And then when, if you know the air strip, Yes, right there. I'm familiar with the, right by, by the entrance of the ERS repair down we are in. And so we are recommending that we go two more miles um, west of the ERS strip. Okay. Right? And so. Um, That's small. It, it's very small. And so it's important uh, and that we pass um, this act. And um, yes, it will be um, more responsibility for the council. But at the same time, we believe that um, the council will be able to make more money on taxes as well. Right, and um, that too will create um, opportunity for us to employ more people, uh, because, like I mentioned, remember I said that we need to create more work for our people, 
right? And uh, that's why I'm also looking at this tourist village because people can create their own work and um, we also will create work in the tourist village um, if we get the tourist village rolling. And again, that is something that I'm hopeful that we will start um, again in this year between 2022 and 2023. It is something that I'll be hammering every two weeks, meeting with people all over Dangriga and encourage them. They can put ice cream parlor, they can have beer parlor, they can have restaurants, they can have places to sell uh, the different um, Garifuna craft. Uh, there's so much. You can have people that go out there um, playing Garifuna music. They can have the different dance group. You know, we have a lot to, in, in the culture, people that make the Garifuna drums. They, you know, so long as we have this centralized, whenever tourists come, they know where to go, right? And so I think that um, making Dangriga a tourist destination would be um, very important because uh, that will help boost the economy of Dangriga and to create even more employment for our people in Dangriga. And you have a rich history too, uh, Mayor, like, like, like we know. You know, one of the ones that I'm fascinated with, if I may in, in, um, say here, is the railroad history um, of Commerce Bight, you know, the, 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 the train that ran from Middle East sex right through until up to Commerce Bight. Yes. And the reason why you have a Y at the entrance of Dangriga is because that's where the train tracks were. Yes. And for a train to turn, it can only turn in a Y. Uh, you know, and so that why was where the train that would go to Commerce Bight Port from Middlesex would turn. You know, it heads into Commerce Bight Port, it does what it has to do, come out back, and then it turns and head up back right at the Y. Yeah, <laughs> so, so you have a rich, you have a rich history, man. Yes, we have a very yeah. rich history here in Dangriga in relation to that Commerce um, Bight Port, and this is why it's important for us to get it back rolling. Yeah. And um, you know we have so much of our young men in Dangriga who have the faith that if um, the port is reopened, um, they can be employed somewhere or the other through the port. And so this is why I will continue to lobby um, with government and non-governmental agents to ensure that we reopen the port as quick as possible. Well, Mayor Robert Moreno, thank you so much for talking with us. I'm really impressed by your life story and your, your, your trajectory in the police department, you know, coming from that young 16-year-old who entered the police department and rising right up to the second in command of the, of the police department. That's quite an achievement and something I'm sure you will always be proud of. Um, I want to also congratulate you for, uh, on your mayorship of the municipality of Dangriga and wish you well. I am particularly impressed, if I may put in my lee once a year, I'm particularly in, impressed with the, your sewing factory, the fact that it's empowering young ladies and teaching them to sew. And I'm more impressed that it doesn't cost them anything. You, you're doing that as something that you're giving back to the, to, to the community. So I think work like this really show and um, should be singled out because that's what we need to do to build our nation, to, to, to contribute more to our fellow Belizeans and to uplift our fellow Belizeans in whatever way we can. Now, in closing this, this the discussion that we have had, which I, like I said, I enjoyed very much, um, is there anything you'd like to say that I did not ask you or anything that you would like to say to your fellow people of Dangriga? Yes, Chief, thank you very much. Um, we in this council have just completed one year um, since being elected into office and I'd like to publicly say thank you to the people of Dangriga and to the people of Belize in extension for giving us the opportunity to serve. Um, I just want them to know that um, we will continue to serve them and we will continue to be their humble servant. Thank you again and um, may God bless the people of Dangriga. Thank you, Mayor Robert Mariano. Belize Watch. Knowledge of the past. Impacting the present. Building the future. <laughs>